So thanks everyone for coming out on this absolutely freezing day, um, the last Friday before reading week. Uh, we really do appreciate um, your attendance at this talk uh, that I'm pleased to introduce today. So my name is Heidi Matthews and I'm an assistant professor here at Osgood and I organize the speaker series along with Professor Palma Pachoco who's here and Professor um, Francois Tanguay Renault, who had his hot water boiler break on the worst possible day of the year and sends his regrets. Um, I also co direct the Nathanson Center um, on Transnational Rights, Crime, and Security with uh, Professor Tanguay Renault. Um, and this is uh, an installment in our special speaker series entitled Emerging Trends in Criminal Justice. Um, we have several of these a year. Um, and uh, we also, of course, want to recognize um, during the thank you part of the introduction, Liel Gonzalez, who is our sort of fearless administrative assistant, who's really helped out with the arrangements for making today possible, as well as um, for our speaker being able to be here. So before I do introduce the speaker, who is Professor Guy Ben Porat, uh, I want to first remind ourselves that, of course, conversations about law policy and healing um, have been happening on the land on which we now find ourselves gathered long before Osgoode Hall was here, long before Toronto was here, and long before Canada was here. And so the Nathanson Centre acknowledges that it sits on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. Um, in particular, this area has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis, um, and is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit uh, First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Um, today's talk will address questions of policing minorities and citizenship. And so I want to also take a moment to recognize it actually happening right now at 12.30 um, downtown at the Toronto Police Headquarters uh, is the 15th annual Strawberry Ceremony for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, Trans and Two-Spirit People. Um, in Ojibwe cultural tradition, the strawberry is known as the heart berry and represents forgiveness and peace. And at today's ceremony, Indigenous people are standing in defense of their lives and are demonstrating against complicity of the state in the ongoing genocide of Indigenous women and Indigenous peoples in general in Canada, um, and the impunity of state institutions and actors, including, of course, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, um, that prevents justice for all Indigenous peoples. Uh, so, let me move on to our speaker. Professor Guy Ben Perot is going to um, talk to us about uh, civic, I believe, yes, the title has remained on change, Civic Le Lessons, Police, Minorities, and Citizenship. He's a professor at the Department of Politics and Government at Ben Gurion University in Israel. He is a political scientist graduate of Johns Hopkins University um, and author of several books, <laughs> including Global Liberalism, Local Populism, Peace and Conflict in Northern Ireland and Israel-Palestine, um, as well as Between State and Synagogue, The Secularization of Contemporary Israel, um, and most recently co-authored with Fanny Yuval, Policing Citizens, Minority po Policy in Israel um, from Cambridge University Press just last year. So I will turn it over to Professor Ben Porat. Thank you very much. Uh, this research actually began in Canada in a very odd way. It was a summer about 15 years ago. I had good friends in Ottawa that I wanted to visit, and there was an offer for a scholarship to come study Canada. And I thought, what well, would be a good way to study Canada? So I said, probably multiculturalism. And then let's narrow it down, and so maybe policing. Uh, so I spent a summer here in Ontario interviewing police officers about what it means to be police officers in a diverse society. Came back to Israel, wrote a conceptual paper on this, uh, and then this developed into a research about Israel. Um, and then as I was writing this book, um, 
I came to realize that my main interest is not so much about police per se, but about citizenship. So when I study policing, I study the state, I study citizenship, and I study the hierarchies within the state. So policing is kind of a leverage point to talk about Israel's uh, ethnic, national, and other schisms. Um, Political scientists have paid limited attention to policing. Um, if you look, if you go to the library and look at books written on the military, then there is whole shelves. Policing has been a neglected topic for political scientists, also for sociologists. It's been mainly been done by criminologists. It has been changing in recent years due to all these incidents that happened in North America and elsewhere. So there's more focus on policing. Um, I think we still need some more theory and some more uh, in-depth understanding of what exactly is this issue of policing. So um, if we go back to Weber and to the discussion of, of the state of Weber by, by Max Weber, then uh, we all know the quote that the state legitimate violence, legitimate monopoly over violence. So we need to make sense of what this violence is exactly. And I'm trying to do that through the concept of citizenship. And uh, again, these, it's, an, it's a study about Israel, but I'm hoping that the, uh, the ideas and maybe some of the lessons are apl applicable also elsewhere. So the modern state, uh, as Weber tells us, is uh, peculiar or something new, especially in terms of the means of violence. So it's a human community that claims the monopoly of the legitimate force within a given territory. So the uniformed police here have not only a practical, but also a symbolic stance. So officers that wear the badge and wear the uniform are reproducing or producing order and representing that order they produce. So there's something symbolically important about police, which I think matters for the cases we, we study. Um, and concepts like order or disorder are by no mere neutral concepts. When we talk about creating order or maintaining order, it's a very specific pattern of domination. What is orderly, what is disorderly, and what is policed accordingly is something I would argue is essentially political. So police is a tool of a regime that is used to create order, which this regime perceives as the correct order. And uh, police relies a lot about trust and legitimacy. I'm gonna use these words quite often in this talk. While I use them interchangeably, uh, there is a difference between them. So legitimacy is the acceptance of the right to rule. So police is legitimate if People, citizens, believe that it has a right to order them to do what they order to do. Trust is the belief that police acts on the behalf of the public. So I, believe, I trust police that it will protect my property or my life. Uh, legitimacy is a bit of a different concept, although when we actually ask the question about legit legitimacy and trust, they often interchange. But I do want to keep them at least initially and as conceptually different. Uh, now citizenship. Now, we tend to think of citizenship as something which is universal and essential to the state. So you could argue that citizenship is one of the most important institutions of the state. It's about the rights of individuals, uh, and it separates those who are from those who aren't citizens. So that's one separation we often use. And often states demarcate themselves against the others. So who is not a citizen? What it means to be a minority is actually a question of citizenship, rights, and status. And minorities have, might have different concerns. They might, want to, they might demand equality, so they feel that they're discriminated. They might demand recognition. They have different needs and concerns that need to be addressed. And they might have both concerns simultaneously. But I'm saying this because minorities come in different shapes and forms. Not all minorities have the same concerns with or against police. And when you do this research, you realize that when you talk about minorities, it's a generalization. So minorities are different, and even within them, 
You can ask about gender and class, which might create different stories. So a minority person who is a woman might have different concerns than a minority person who is a man. A minority person who is rich more than that who is poor. So these differences also need to be kept in mind. But the most important point that I want to make about citizenship is that also internally, it is not universal. So you could do the separation between citizens and non-citizens. But also within citizenship, it's also often about discrimination and hierarchies. So while people have formally the same status as citizens, in practice, in everyday life, their citizenship has a different meaning. And security or securitization is one of the ways in which the hierarchies are created. So when you look through the lens of security on citizens, then some of them might be perceived as those deserving security, some as those deserving less security, and some being a threat to security. So security creates those divisions among citizens. Okay, that's, you can think of it as very practical terms. Who do we arrest? Who do we stop? Who do we ask for papers? So securitization has often an ethnic component or a racial component or a class component. So citizenship is divided by securitization into these hierarchies which uh, are critical for understanding citizenship. Now, here's where I connect citizenship and policing. My argument, not only mine, but I use that in, in this book, is that policing is a very good indication of citizenship. So this encounter between officers and citizens is kind of a litmus test for their citizenship. This banal encounter on the street can have very important meanings. Now, I'm saying that because when we study policing in minorities, we often look at the incidents that are extreme. Okay, the killing of people by the police, the beating of people by the police. Those draw attention. But the everyday life, okay, regular interactions, which don't have that drama, might be no less important to understand the context than those incidents are. And when we investigate those incidents, um, we often tend to narrow or zoom in on a very particular question. So why was the shot fired? Did the policeman feel a danger? Did he make a reasonable choice? These investigations for uh, the non-minority citizen are very reassuring because they have a result. Either we find the police officer guilty and then he was punished, so everything is fine. So there was an extreme event, a man was shot by an officer, the officer was punished, end of story. Or even better, the officer was found to be not guilty, so everything is fine. And the way we look at police and the way we perceive police tells us something about our citizenship. Are we afraid of police? Are we concerned with the officer on the street? Or do we feel relieved? Would we call police in case of trouble? Would we avoid calling police? So policing is a very uh, critical point of citizenship. Because the state is often a very abstract term. Okay, can you relate to the state? Well, it has some symbolic issues, has a bureaucracy, but policing is a bureaucracy you can actually feel on the street. And think of the power police officers have more than other bureaucrats. They can stop you, they can arrest you, they can order you to leave the place. So it's a bureaucracy that has a lot of power. And those interactions with police, like other bureaucracies, socialize citizens to what are, is their citizenship. Okay, if I'm treated respectably, and equally, it tells me something about myself. If I'm treated with disrespect or through a security lens, then I learn about my status. I would know to avoid an officer. Now, of course, it's social learning. I don't have to go through it myself. So if I am of certain ethnicity or certain skin color or certain gender, uh, there's enough information around me to know whether to avoid police or to engage with police. So interactions with officers 
tell people what citizens are they? What kind of citizens are you? Are you an equal citizen or are you a threat? Or are your citizens not de deserving of protection? Uh, so there's a symbolic issue here. So being mistreated by police also has a symbolic value. It tells you something. So if you're treated by a police officer in a rude way, it's an everyday experience, then it tells you something about your status within the state. When police treats you fairly, it signals something. You're on the same side. What the Americans call the thin blue line. You're on the right side of the thin blue line. So if police officer treats you with respect, he perceives you as a citizen that is worthy of respect. If he treats you in a disrespectful way, you're on the other side of the thin blue line. So this has also, it has practical implication, whether you can move around in the public space or not, but also symbolic implications. How do you perceive the state, society, etc.? How do you perceive yourself within that state and society? Um, and what we are seeing in many countries, including in Israel, is what we call segmented citizenship. So formally, it's universal citizenship. We're all citizens. It's the same law, it's the same thing, we're talking entitlements, but in practice it's segmented. We don't get the same treatment in different institutions, and it relates to our class, ethnicity, gender, etc. Um, so there's a legitimacy question here. For minorities who are mistreated by the police, would they perceive police as legitimate? If the order police reproduces and produces is perceived as an unjust order, is police perceived as legitimate? Uh, can you trust police if you think it is racist or bigoted in other ways? So there are questions of legitimacy and trust that come through the story of policing. Um, and again, we can think of three types of citizens in this hierarchy. Those who are respected and deserve police protection. Those who are neglected because of different issues and do not receive protection. And those are perceived as threats. So in this public space, it matters who you are and what you are. Um, so minorities can distrust police for different reasons. Uh, they can distrust police because of overarching questions of legitimacy. So if I'm a minority and I believe this state is offensive to my group, to, my, to, to myself, then police is part of this unjust order. So why should I trust or see them as legitimate? Okay, the order enforcing is an unjust order. So that's on the, on the greater, if you will, moral alignment question. Um, but there's also particular questions that can make police less trusted and legitimate. And I'll divide them for the comfort of argument for two kind of overarching policies. What is what they call over-policing? Meaning profiling, meaning more use of force, more use of violence. So minorities who suffer from over-policing will be stopped more by police, will be arrested more by police, and will be more exposed to police violence. So that's the over-policing. Under-policing is neglect. So minorities who are under-policed will feel insecure, that they live in neighborhoods where nobody bothers to care about these neighborhoods. They will suffer from a drug problem in the neighborhood or gangs, and the police will just not be there. Now, these two don't exclude each other. So you could be both under and over-policed. So if you are in your own neighborhood, you might feel under-policed. You ask yourself, where is the police when I need them? When you leave your neighborhood, you'll be stopped and searched. So you'll be over-policed. So it could happen simultaneously. It could happen at different levels. As I said before, different minorities might have different issues with state, society, and with police. So now, after kind of establishing the theoretical part of this work, I want to talk about the Israeli case. Um, so here we have three pictures from Israel. On the left, on the, your right hand, it's a picture of young Ethiopian youths who are protesting against police violence and over-policing. Talk about this in detail in a few minutes. Um, on your left-hand side, there are Arab citizens. protesting against police lack of action in their neighborhoods, claiming that police simply does not care and let them be killed in their neighborhoods. So they demand actually have a more effective police. 
In the middle, you have uh, African Americans or and their supporters in the U.S. protesting against police violence, the so-called Black Lives Matter movement. Now, in the Ethiopian demonstrations in Israel, we have seen signs with Black Lives Matter. So Ethiopians and Israel adopted some of this discourse from abroad because it happened at the same time. So the idea that skin color happens to correlate with police violence has been seen as something that's not happening only in Israel. And I'll come to that in a few minutes. Um, so what did we do in this research? Um, the point here was to try and see how different citizens of different groups perceive police and policing. So basically, we talk to people. We want to know their perceptions, what their beliefs about police are, what they stem from, how they interpret different issues, what are their expectations, and how does all this relate to their citizenship. Um, and we chose four different groups, and I'll talk about two of them in detail. And the four groups we chose, we thought of them as more of a generic type of minority. So one group was citizens of Ethiopian descent. Okay, it's a relatively small group of about 130,000 people immigrated to Israel in the 1990s and onwards who are distinguished by their skin color and who are subjected to police violence. That's one group we thought interesting. Second group was the Arab citizens. It's a national minority in a Jewish state who suffered from all kinds of discriminations uh, and suffered from both police violence and police neglect. The third group was Jews uh, from the former Soviet Union. So there's an immigration that came at the same time with the Ethiopians, more or less. However, they are white. They had higher human capital. They are about a million people. So they have strong political, political power for them. And uh, they have integrated much better economically than the other groups and politically. But we thought here's an immigrant group. Here is a comparison of a strong immigrant group versus a weaker immigrant group. And the fourth group was ultra-Orthodox Jews, who uh, often clash with police in demonstrations. We talk about the Haredi groups that have the, the traditional black garb. Um, and their re relation with police is quite tense, however, limited to specific interactions. And we did a comparative group, which was Israelis of none of the other types. So they were like our control group. So we have five groups we compare, and we have used two methods. One was a survey, and the other was the focus groups. So we began with the focus groups. And the idea was to, in each of these research groups, like these four groups, to have six focus groups with about 10 to 12 individuals in an open conversation with a moderator that we hired, who was to talk about people about Generally, they thought about police, their experiences, a very open talk with some leading questions. When we had the material from the focus groups, we developed our survey. So we had focus groups and then a survey. So we have these two methods. Um, the advantage is, I'm not sure if any of you are doing uh, quantitative work, that surveys give you numbers. Okay, so you know that this group trusts police less than the other group by 0.5 something. Uh, the focus will give you, give you kind of the explanation for these numbers. Okay, you get some more of, a, of an open talk and you get some ideas of why they feel this way. And we had different paradoxes that came in the research that the focus groups helped us to identify and to, uh, to work with. So uh, let me begin with talking about, a bit about Israel and the Israeli police. So Israel has uh, a centralized police force. There's one police force with a central command that is uniform in all its operations. So it's not the Ontario and the RCMP and the Quebec police, it's one police. This has implications uh, for research. Uh, so in the US, at least, I'm not sure it's in Canada, you can do research on a police, you'll get cooperation, on condition you, you won't publish what police you worked with. So you can do a study in St. Louis, and then you will write 
a police force in the Midwest and the U.S. Can't be done in Israel. Okay, they're all the same. So, which, which means police is reluctant to cooperate with people who do research, especially with critical research. They're okay with good research, but critical research they're not so happy with. So we didn't get much cooperation from police. Um, then the police in Israel is very close to the military due to Israel's uh, history, structure, etc. So most officers, almost all officers, will come from the military, at least they'll do their basic military service. Much of the high command of the police will be from the military. So high-ranking officers from the military will move to police and do their career there. One of the units called the border police is a police force that belongs to the military. So it's a very close relationship between the two. So when we talk about the militarized police, in Israel it's a bit, well, yes, they are militarized police because they work military. However, and unlike the US police, Israeli police does not use firearms that much. So it is important to note, because, because we'll talk about this later, the number of people being shot to death by police is relatively limited. Crime in Israel is not as high as in the US, so violent crime is not that high. When police shoot citizens, it is an extreme case. So, not incidental that most of those who were shot by police were either Ethiopians or Arab. But still, it's not hundreds, okay? it's small numbers. Yet, compared to others who, were, who are not shot by, shot, shot by police, it's important. So, Israeli, Jewish, white will not be, shoot, will not be shot by police. So police does not term, tend to use arms indiscriminately. Um, police has a problematic image in Israel. It's the unsuccessful brother of the military. So while the military enjoys a very uh, prestige in Israel, it has much respect. Police in the general public are perceived in less positive eyes. Now, and this relates to what I said before, People can have negative opinions of police, but for different reasons. And it's important to note kind of a general difference between majority and minorities. Majorities negative view of police will be often tied to performance. Okay, the reason I think police are X, Y, and Z is because they do not perform well. I'm concerned for my property, for my safety, and I simply don't see police doing the job. Minorities might be more concerned with fairness. Police is unfair. They are racist, they are bigoted, they are this and that and that. So dissatisfaction with police, the aggregate number, does not tell us much about practices. Why do people distrust police? And I think that this is a difference that is, is important to stress. Uh, Israeli citizenship is also very hierarchical. This could be a whole lecture by itself, but let's say that the idea of a Jewish and democratic state, these two values Israel adheres to, or claims to adhere to, are values with contradictions. So the Jewish state means that Jews are preferred or over non-Jews or over Arabs, so to speak, and citizenship, while it formally it is equal, and even that's not always true, there are deep differences between Jews and non-Jews in Israel. Um, Israel, obviously, is a very divided country with deep schisms between Arab and Jew, uh, religious and secular, uh, Jews from Europe and Jews from, from, that came from, from the, the Muslim countries. So you have all these schisms which matter here also. It's very securitized. So it's a con an ongoing conflict for more than 70 years. So police are fighting terrorism and fighting crime, and sometimes it's the same thing for them. So securitization is a big issue in Israel. And again, this all comes down to this issue of Jewish and democratic. So to maintain a Jewish state, uh, do you sometimes give up on some democratic principles uh, and that's a big debate that I think the next elections uh, are mostly about. Um, so let me begin with the, with, the, with the case of Arab citizens. So we can use Arab or Palestinian citizens, 
It's, this itself could be an argument of what these people are, how do you define them, how they define themselves. I'll stick to Arab citizen just for the comfort of the argument, but I'm very good with Palestinian as well. Uh, we could say that this is a contested citizenship. So Arab citizens in Israel are a minority of about 20% who is discriminated and marginalized. Uh, they don't belong to the Jewish nation. Therefore, different policies separate Jews from non-Jews and there are privileges that Jews have which non-Jews don't have. Um, so it's a deep schism based on a history of 70 or maybe 100 years, depends where you want to start counting. Obviously, Arab citizens have a lack of moral alignment with the police. If you're an Arab citizen, the order police enforces is the order of the Jewish state. So obviously, you cannot identify fully with this order. However, Arab citizens are going through some form of integration, what we call pragmatic integration. So they live there, they have some rights that they want to exploit and advance, they do better than previous years in the labor market, in higher education, so there is some mobility there, it's not static. Um, so it means that the relation with police is a complex relation. So moral, moral alignment is not there, but police is still perceived as something we need in everyday life. So we can't just give up on it. Um, police then has a uh, troubled relations with Arab citizens. They are securitized, so they're a security threat, quote unquote, which means they'll be subjected to stronger police practices. Um, now, uh, we're talking about a minority of 20%, so it's not a small minority, who is going through, again, they're becoming more nationalist, because if you're an outcast, you will develop your own identity, but they're also integrating. So these contradictions will be very important when we discuss the policing issue. The whole policing of Arab citizens, the whole, the whole relations with police, there is one major event that is kind of in the background of everything. The 2000 events, the October 2000 events. October 2000 began the second intifada of the Palestinians in Israel, following the failed King David attempts and Ariel Sharon uh, climb to Al-Aqsa. Um, this intifada, this uprising, was in the West Bank and Gaza, but also came into Israel with Israeli citizens, Palestinians, protesting against Israel policy. Those demonstrations uh, were uh, relatively, I'd say, tense and extreme, during which police gunned down 13 citizens. Again, this was a very extraordinary event. So that number of citizens killed by police in, in several days was quite an event. Um, there was an investigation committee afterwards to investigate what happened. The investigation committee found the police at fault for using arms indiscriminately. It found the state at, state at fault for years of discrimination, which created this tension and, 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 uh, and clashes with the police. Yet, no police officer was charged with anything. So the police in general were found guilty, but police officers as people did not face trials. Some were dismissed from the force, that was it. So for Arab citizens, this is an unclosed story, a story that has not finished. We are still demanding, we want to see people involved in these killings prosecuted. However, since 2000, we see something else. Their Arab communities in Israel have deep internal problems. Uh, I'll do kind of a one sociology on one leg. So this was, this was a traditional society that had a structure that kept it intact. So until the 1990s, Arab citizens could go along without police. They had their own institution that could keep things in order. So from the police perspective, this was fine. We'd rather give our resources to the Jewish population. For the Arabs, that was, that was fine too. We don't want police here. 
We know they're not going to do any good for us. So until the, the 1990s or even the 2000s, police was neither desired in the Arab, Arab towns, nor did they want to be there. However, something happened. The traditional structures are falling apart, and there is chaos on those communities. We're talking about uh, gangs, about illegal weapons, about shootings between gangs with those illegal weapons. So just to give the simple number, since 2000, including the events, the police shot about 51 Arab citizens to death. At the same period, more than 1,300 were killed by internal violence. So if you're an Arab citizen and you just live your life, your major concern is not police, but the gangs in your town. Okay, that is your major concern. Now, uh, under policing, when we first did our, our surveys, we were a bit surprised because the surveys were saying the Arab citizens actually want to have more police in their neighborhoods, which with the background of the 2000 events made no sense. But then we look at the data of what's happening there, it made more sense. So the level of violence has become so high that while over-policing is still an issue, under-policing is way more significant in their perspective. Um, so uh, under-policing is perceived by them as neglect. Okay, it's, not, it's not an incidental. And there are two narratives that we hear from them. One is the more extreme one. The state wants us to have this violence. Okay, we kill each other, they're happy. That's the more extreme narrative. The more moderate narrative and the more popular one is that they simply don't care. If in another neighborhood in Israel, there'll be three, four killings in a month, police would find the shooters. Police would put order in that town. It's an Arab town, nobody cares. Um, now going back to the methodology I talked about before. So we asked people two questions. The first question is more than two, but two that are important here. One is that, uh, do you think police provide security for you? And there are many that would say no. Okay, regardless of class, ethnicity, no, not happy with police. But then we ask another question. Compared to others, how is police for you? So then majority of us will say, well, well, it's the same. Everyone's saying no. We are getting a different policing than others. So they see this as something which is differentiated them from others. So this under policing is quite critical. Um, now this leads even to, you could call this pragmatism or maybe more negative words of willingness to cooperate with police. Now they're reluctantly, okay? Police is not trusted. Okay, police is still perceived as an apparatus of a, an oppressive state. Yet, what are the choices? So it's reluctant, but yet it's significant. Um, now, we see the difference between politicians on the national and on, on the local level. So party members who are in the parliament will be more vocally opposed to cooperation with police. Okay, they will talk the political talk mayors would have a different voice. Because from the mayor perspective, I have a crime issue in my town. Things are falling apart here. I need to resolve this. That's my responsibility. And I don't see anyone else doing it but the police. So there is some uh, pragmatism there. So living in fear is a major theme that we hear from Arab citizens. So it's a part of it everyday life. We can't rely on state institutions. It's criminal violence. There are 100 armed men who enforce their will upon this whole community. Okay, these are the gangs that have weapons. Uh, mothers are afraid. We hear this a lot. Uh, I will not send my son after dark outside. He could be a victim of incidental shooting. Uh, a teacher tells us, I think my students hold weapons. I think I, I'm a high school teacher or principal and I know for certain that some of my students 
have weapons in their homes, illegal weapons. So it's a macho culture among young people and also a fear. I, have, I need to have a weapon to protect myself. That's what happens when we don't have a police force around. Um, so as I said, it's a, it's a perception of neglect. So when we talk in the focus groups, we ask them, yes, in the Jewish towns, police is more invested. They care about, about, about Jewish towns. If there's a murder in a police town, in a, in a Jewish town, police will find the murderer in a second. They'll be there, they'll work on the case, and they'll find him. Here, they will never find him. Um, and they don't think it's a problem of qualifications. It's not the police can't, it's that they don't want to. So from their perspective, police, it's not an efficiency. It's not lack of skills. It's a lack of will. Because in their perception, in Jewish towns, police do a damn good job. Murderers get arrested. In our towns, they don't. Uh, so cooperation with police. Are they willing to cooperate with police? So reluctantly, I would say yes, under, of course, some conditions. Uh, one question we asked about recruitment. Would you consider joining the police? Would you want one of your friends or neighbors to join the police? About 35% say yes. It's a huge number considering the background. So that's not a small number. Um, and they're saying there's no alternative. What else can we do? Okay, we are in a dire crisis here. People are being killed left and right. People are afraid to walk the streets. We have no option but to have a stronger police. Uh, going now to the Ethiopians, the second case, which is very different. So for Ethiopians, uh, the issue of police is mostly about police violence. Um, and in their interviews, and also in the papers, they were talking about the comparison to Baltimore. So they were saying, you know, I'm not sure it's the same thing, but I can see the, the resemblance. I am black, they're black, they're police violence, you're black, so they, they do see the resemblance. Uh, they see themselves as race, racialized my, my minorities. Um, they are visible minorities, which means that they can be picked up by police. Now, Arabs are not visible minorities. So you can't drive while Arab. Okay? Police officers will not be able to pick an Arab person driving a car, unless a traditional woman with the, with the head garb, but mostly Arab citizens who walk around are not identified immediately. Ethiopians are identified. It's a major issue. Now, I'm saying racialized because Ethiopians want to integrate into Israel. They perceive themselves as Jews who came to their home country, and discrimination for them is perceived as simply uncalled for. Okay, we are Jewish, we're part of this nation. In their demonstration, they would come often wrapped with flags. So they would demonstrate against racism, but would come with Israeli flags. So we think the state is racist, but we're still part of that state. And they will always tell about their military service. So I was in the paratroopers. I was in this, I was in that. I don't deserve to be treated this way. So the ethnicity card, the being Jewish, is a very important card for them to play in demanding their integration. Um, however, uh, Ethiopians are on the lower strata of the socioeconomic ladder in Israel high level of poverty, lots of uh, youth that are without any uh, uh, education or fall outside of the education system. In the military, though they join the military, many of them do not complete their service. Uh, the military jails, the number of Ethiopians is very high compared to the numbers. So we have here uh, a group that is definitely being discriminated and is being, and is being marginalized in Israeli society. Um, Interestingly, uh, when we did the survey, we had a very strange result. So Ethiopians were, on the one hand, saying, yes, the police is racist, police is unfair, police is violent. But they had the higher trust of police than all other groups, even the control group. It was a puzzle to us. So if you think police is racist, and discriminating, why would you trust police? 
Then we went back to the focus groups and did some more interviews and read some more. And our explanation that we think is valid is that for Ethiopians to declare racism as something which is structural is to put themselves outside the Jewish ethnicity. So they're trying to minimize or compartmentalize racism. It's not all officers. It's just some officers. It's a temporal thing. It will go away sometime. Maybe our youth also is a bit problematic. So the racism is downplayed or it's overplayed by the issue of we are Jewish, we belong here. We are not like the Arabs. Okay, and some of the same are saying, why do you treat us like Arabs? We're not Arabs. We are Jewish, we serve in the military. So this card is very important for them. There are two names that uh, were used in those demonstrations, which I'll spend a minute on describing these names. One is Yosef Salamsa. Yosef Salamsa uh, was a young Ethiopian man. He was picked up by police. Uh, he was drunk, was brought to the police station, handcuffed, was left outside the station because he was throwing up, so they left him outside the station. His family came and picked him up later. I think they paid bail and released him. Uh, he came back home, he was traumatized by the event. On top of that, police were claimed to have harassed him. So they threatened the family not to file complaints against the police. Like a month later, he was found dead at the bottom of a quarry. Uh, the police ruled it as suicide. The Ethiopian narrative is he was killed by the police. Okay, there was execution. Now, I'm not sure it's true. But this is the narrative. This is the deep level of distrust in police. Avera Mengisto uh, is a uh, young Ethiopian man who crossed the border into Gaza. Uh, he was mentally ill. He one day left his home in Ashkelon, a southern city in Israel, and just crossed the border into Gaza and disappeared. It's been more than four years ago. We'd, nobody knows where he is at the moment. From the Ethiopian perspective, again, this is a story of discrimination. Had Avera been a white Jewish Israeli, we would have brought him back by now. So it's a very deep ingrained sense of discrimination. Um, the major story we get is profiling from the Ethiopians. Uh, this is a story mostly of young men. In 2015, Ethiopians demonstrated against police. Now, the event that sparked this demonstration was a beating of a young Ethiopian soldier. He was walking in Tel Aviv. An officer ordered him to move to the other side of the street. There were some exchanges between them. Then another officer came about, and they too beat him up. He was in uniform. It was taped and became viral. Now, this sparked a reaction. And what I understand from talking with him is that some, many of them suddenly thought that it's not just me that's being abused by police. So before that, people say, well, it happened to me, but it might be just me. But when the Damas Picada, the soldier video was aired, more and more stories came up, like resurfaced. And I think that we, 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 did, we did the survey a bit before that, that event. I think if we would have done the survey now, we would have had different results. I think it created a change of atmosphere within the Ethiopians. Um, so the perception was that it is something that is regular, something that's common, that police pick up on Ethiopians, that they are arrested just for being black in the public sphere. Uh, a TV reporter did this uh, story yeah, two or three years ago. She took two young Ethiopian men, put them on a bench in a public park in northern Tel Aviv, which is a very white, rich area. It took five minutes to have two cars of police come by and ask people, what, what are they doing there? She just put them on a bench, had a camera hidden in the bushes. Five minutes, you have police officers coming to these two guys. What are you doing here? We're just sitting. Why here? Why not? Can I see your identity? Can you empty your pockets for me? So this was just five minutes it took this to happen, so this is a story. Now, the other story that comes is a story of vulner vulnerability. And we had this sentence in different focus groups from different people, almost the same sentence, which was like, uh, if a white kid 
And they use the term white, by the way. They use the term white and black, which is kind of a new term in Israel. You don't use that that much. If a white kid would have been picked by police for nothing, his mother would come down the station and raise hell. For us, nobody will fight. So it's a question of vulnerability. Okay, we're alone. It's, it's a police and us, and we can't really resist them. So vulnerability and visibility is what make the Ethiopian case very, uh, very strong. Um, now, cooperation. Are they willing to cooperate with, with uh, police? So as I said before, there is an attempt often to downplay racism. So there is some racism. It's not systemic. It's going to disappear at some point. They know we're Jewish. They respect us. So there is some, at least before 2015, there was some optimism about that. Uh, we need to respect police in order to get respect from them. So there, there was even some, especially among the older ones, a bit of self, some self-blame. Okay, maybe also our young people should behave properly. Uh, there is respect to police as institution. It's a state, it's the flag. It's something that we, we, we can identify with. Uh, and there's no problem with recruitment to police. The border police, which I mentioned before, which is this uh, unit which is both military and police, has many Ethiopian men in that unit. It's a unit that is mostly of people that come from a low socioeconomic background. Therefore, you'll find them many Ethiopian young people there. It's units that are used mostly to patrol the West Bank. That's the purpose of these units. Uh, so many Ethiopians are in the police, and they might even move to real police afterwards. So they'll be in the green police, border patrol, and then join the blue police afterwards. However, uh, they don't think that this really creates a change. And if we look at research elsewhere, they have a good reason to think so. Uh, research shows that bringing officers of a certain color to the police does not change the police. Okay, Baltimore police has many black officers. Uh, so does the uh, St. Louis, Missouri police. Uh, it still doesn't change police behavior. So there's a good thing there. What they strongly resist is cultural training. And that's interesting. And this is especially after 2015. For young Ethiopians, the idea of cultural training is telling them that they're not part of the major group. And they were saying very clearly, this is BS, cultural training. We are Israelis. We speak Hebrew. We were born here. We were raised here. There is no cultural issue. The issue is police racism. Go treat yourself. Don't learn about us. And this comes very strongly from a young movement of Ethiopians who are very adamant in claiming that police needs to reform its own, not talk about how to know us. We don't need to know you. We need to behave better. That's what we're asking you to do. Um, let me say something about the, uh, the ultra-Orthodox, just in, a, in, in two sentences. Since you came here, I won't disappoint you. So ultra-Orthodox have altercations with police, mostly in demonstrations. Ultra-Orthodox have huge conflicts with the state, mostly about recruitment to the military, which they, which, which they oppose, and police intervening in their neighborhoods. So they want to have their neighborhoods free of police. Their idea is, we can police ourselves. We are religious, we have morals, we have order, we don't need, we don't have crime, we don't need police here. Um, so one issue is clashing with police in demonstrations where they claim police uses brutality against them, which apparently there is reason to say so. So there are, you can look at online, there are, there are, there are tapes of police breaking up ultra-Orthodox demonstrations where they use water cannons, they use those stink cannons, they use clubs. It's not very pleasant because the extreme Orthodox are perceived as not part of us, they don't serve in the military, so henceforth we can use force against them, it's legitimate. However, in the focus groups came some interesting voices which were not sure how, how representative they are. This requires another research. Which talked about actually under-policing. And the argument there was that in those Haredi, in those ultra-Orthodox communities, there's issues of domestic abuse, of children abuse, 
which are hidden under the carpet. And we need police there to resolve that. Now, this dilemma is something that can be thought of in a wider context of what's happening to the Orthodox community in Israel. On the one hand, they want to stay in their close communities and intact, but also they're opening to the world. And there is kind of a divergence there. Some want to be more open, some want to be less open, some would want to be strongly related to the state, some want to avoid the state. So these dilemmas are also in their interactions and perceptions of police. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that through these three groups, we can see how policing defines citizenship. So in the case of Arab citizens, their lower status and their hierarchy within a Jewish state is exemplified both in the way police neglect their needs and the use of force when necessary. So police, when they come into their neighborhoods, they say, comes not to help us, but to securitize us. Not secure, securitize. So that's one group. Um, the Ethiopians are of a lower socioeconomic status, racialization and racism, uh, which means they are subjected to more police uh, arrests and to more police violence. Uh, we had about six or seven killings of young Ethiopians by the police. And we had this argument before. Uh, if you look at it case by case, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, so this is like a very, very kind of a, let's say it, a, a non-expert eyes. If you look at it case by case, you could say, well, maybe it's not, you ca I can't say for sure that police here was racist or police here used extreme force. But when you take all these cases, Look at them together. And well, they're all Ethiopians. Had the result been different if they were not Ethiopians, then you're saying to yourself, well, the answer is probably yes. So the fact that in the last two years, the police gunned down about four or five young Ethiopians and zero Jewish white Israelis is, I think, telling. Um, Ultra-Orthodox. They have a higher status, they are strong politically. Uh, they can resist police. So the complaints about police are limited, which means that they uh, complain about police on specific incidents. Different, differently stated, if you're an Orthodox and you walk down the street and you see an officer, you have no reason to fear him. He will not interact with you. If you're in a demonstration, then you might be concerned. Uh, Russian immigrants, show the same pattern as veteran Israelis, meaning that they complain about police, that they're inefficient, but they don't feel discriminated against, they don't fear police, uh, they see police in the same, through the same eyes that veterans do, which demonstrates that strong in, into immigration uh, has a different take on its citizenship than a weaker or weakened immigration. Uh, Police and minorities, distrust, and again, can come from different sources, from moral alignment, from uh, over-policing and under-policing. You can have different kind of, they play in different ways in different groups, but it's important to kind of try and separate it as you try to explain how the groups perceive police and themselves as citizens. And I think what makes groups uh, most wary of police are two issues, it's visibility and vulnerability. So groups who are visible will be more targeted by police. If they're vulnerable, they'll be more exposed to police, uh, police brutality. So going back to our cases, Arabs are somewhat visible and vulnerable, being perceived as enemies of the state, so to speak. Ethiopians are visible and vulnerable, hence being subjected to police violence. Ultra-Orthodox are visible but not vulnerable, which means that they can resist police, except again in those demonstrations. And Russians are neither visible, neither vulnerable, hence they play the same citizenship as do regular Israelis. And I'll stop here, thank you.
you so much for your talk. So um, I think we are going to take some questions. And, and just um, if you do have a question, uh, Professor Matthews and I will pass around the microphones, which are not for projection, but are necessary for recording. So I will uh, ask you to please uh, wait for the mic. And here you go. Thank you. Uh, so hi, thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Um, we know each other from before, so I already said a few of the things I think about um, about your book and the arguments. Um, so I think the first thing I want to highlight, so first a quick comment and then maybe a few questions. The first thing is I think that, uh, for example, when you talk about the, uh, the narrative in the Salamsa case, right, that uh, supposedly the uh, Ethiopian Jews and Maybe we can talk more about how we call uh, the subjects of the research. Uh, but the Ethiopian Jews were feeling that perhaps what happened to Salamsa is that he didn't uh, commit suicide, but it was just um, executed. So I want to add on that, that the narrative wasn't just informed by that. It was also informed by the fact that, the, uh, that there weren't charges brought by the unit that investigates the police and then the legal advisor to the police, uh, to, sorry, to the government, the, our former solicitor general didn't, uh, uh, didn't uh, agree to press charges. And then the, the Supreme Court on, uh, on litigating uh, this case um, decided not, not to go with charges. So that's, I think, important to mm. emphasize the role of law and the interaction between law and the other kind of bodies that are at play yeah. here. Uh, and then uh, two questions. Um, one is that um, I'm really interested in the, in the role of multiculturalism in your theory, in your conceptualization at large. And we know that some, uh, there are uh, grassroots groups who feel that multiculturalism might be sometimes the cure, but sometimes it is actually the problem. And you kind of highlighted that uh, in your book. Um, you talk about uh, multicultural, multicultural training, which is something uh, you're an expert of. And I would like uh, to perhaps, I'd be curious to hear more about this issue of multiculturalism as the, uh, as the cure or the problem, and how does that relate to your conceptual theory at large? Um, and then a second question is about language. Uh, one of the things that, um, come through the, the book is that you use this phrase of uh, perceived institutional racism. Uh, and you also talk about real and perf uh, perceived racism throughout the book. Uh, and so this invokes for me questions of voice, tone, and positionality. And I wonder if you can share with us some of the challenges yeah. uh, you might have as a researcher on this front as well. Thank yes. you. Um. Let me start with the second question. This was a big debate because uh, since we don't have police data, what we have is people's, what they're telling us. And the police will tell us, well, okay, that's their opinions, but they're wrong, okay? So they're saying that they're discriminated. They're not discriminated. I can tell you that we're there, they're not. Uh, this guy was, sh was shot because it was the right decision. Um, Ethiopians say they're picked up more than others. Not true. Uh, so there's, there's a denial. Um, so you use, you, you use perceived racism, and I've got a way to get, to get away from that. Uh, and we do say explicitly two things. First, that uh, perceptions don't stem from nowhere. So if people believe they are uh, mistreated, uh, they probably are. And every time they check that, it was found out. So in Baltimore, for example, which is a good case uh, where police, and in, in, in the LAPD 20 years ago, when actually someone, someone went and did the research on the police with police data, it was confirmed that police is racist. So my answer to police is, okay, you claim it doesn't, give us the data. Very simple, okay? That's, that's the only way you can get out of it. But not, not less important is that uh, perception also important because in these everyday encounters, perception matter. So if I think you're racist or you think I'm racist and we now meet each other, it's an important issue. So perceptions are not just things you think. Perceptions create reality and vice versa. So perceptions for me are important. Uh, the problem is, again, that with, without the real data, 
it's hard to confirm how deep this thing is inside the police and until we actually have uh, the opportunity. There is a city legend that uh, 20 years ago, the police did a research among officers on their perceptions of Arab citizens. It's somewhere in a safe, deep, 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 uh, where no eye can ever see it. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but uh, when I began the research, I actually did, did tell the police that I want to cooperate with them. So I called the uh, police chief scientist. They have, a, they have a scientist in the police, as you probably know. And I said I want to do research. And he didn't even answer my, uh, my email. And then I called. And then he said, yeah, yeah, I got your email. What's the point? I'm like, I want to know uh, perceptions of police among Arab citizens and among others. And he said, oh, we know the answer. It's 3.0. OK, well, it's like the, uh, catch the uh, hitchhiker, hitchhiker guys to the galaxy. What, what, what was the question? I said, well, we did a survey. It's 3.0 across everyone. So we know we're good. We don't need your research. Thank you very much. So with, with this attitude, it's very hard to, to, to know the real facts. But again, I think we make a strong claim that it is. Regarding multiculturalism, uh, I've been studying this for 20 years. I'm not sure I still know what it means exactly. Because there, I mean, it's like one of these big elephants that depends where you touch upon it. I'd say there are, there, there, there are kind of three ways you can conceptualize multiculturalism. You can talk about it in more kind of a philosophical ethic terms, right? So which is about the idea of multiculturalism as, 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 as a good or bad thing. You can talk about it as a fact. So countries are diverse, hence they're de facto multicultural. And you can talk about it in terms of policy, about multicultural policies. So if we are diverse, we need to react to this diversion. So I would say that on the first issue, on the, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fair thing, multiculturalism. I mean, I, I don't think there's any better way to engage with a diverse society. It's also a fact in many countries. Now the question is, how do you tone the policies to your ethical and to your factual? Uh, and that's what we're trying to do somehow in this book. But I think that uh, it's a very general term. It has to be tailored to specific groups. And that's why I make these distinctions. When you talk about Ethiopians or about Arab citizens, multiculturalism might mean different things to the two of them. OK, what do you mean by multiculturalism? For Arab citizens, it's about maybe recognition of their nationality, which is something greater than multicultural, it's about actually nationality. For Ethiopians at the moment, uh, it's something that, at least from the young people that we talk to, is not very important because for them, they want to be full Israelis. So for their perspective, all these cultural issues are in the way. Now we know from research that often this comes later. So second generation will bring the multicultural, not the first, the second generation will bring multiculturalism. First generation will struggle for inclusion, will struggle for being equal. Second generation, like a Maslow pyramid. Second generation say, okay, now we are equal, at least formally. Now we have rights, now we have a job, now let's talk about our identity. So Ethiopians are still on the stage where they fight for their equality. So all this talk about Ethiopian folklore and its maintenance, uh, they're not against it, of course, but they think of it as some kind of, of diverting the, the debate from the main issues. So let's not talk about our culture and about our food and about our music. Let's talk about your racism. Okay, when you first talk about this, then we can go talk about, about culture. So multiculturalism has uh, different meanings also, also for different groups. Uh, for the ultra-Orthodox, it's about actually maintaining strong boundaries from the state. So it's a big topic, and we try to break it down through the cases and through the theories. I hope we're doing a fair job in that. Hi, thank you. I enjoyed that as someone who's been to Israel a couple of times for academic things. Um, so there's a couple of questions that troubled me about your research. So. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's really quite a fascinating take, but there's sort of two things I would push you on. So one of which is this idea of Arabs. So, I mean, I would, I mean, so I would not divide Jews and Arabs just as a North American with different ways of classifying populations, because of course I think 
Jews could be Arabs, right? But even okay. ignoring that within the Israel, and I recognize the source of the Israeli discourse on that discussion. Right. Uh, but it does strike me that there is a sort of about ten percent of Israeli Arabs are Christian, and then another slightly less than that are Druze, no. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it would be interesting yeah. to see how those subpopulations relate to the police. Right. And then the second question is: so I'm thinking about my own experience in Israel. As I've gotten older, the Israeli police treat me very differently as a foreigner, right? When I was 25, I was sort of prime North American, radical, politically suspicious age. And I was treated very differently as a foreigner by the police. Now that I'm over 40, and I was back a couple years ago, I'm treated entirely differently, right? I'm no longer seen as a security threat. And so then I'm thinking more broadly about either Israel with its large, well, large foreign population in Tel Aviv of African migrants or then other countries in the region that have large foreign populations. I'm not convinced that the citizenship framework is necessarily the best way to consider relationships to the police, where in many ways foreigners are also going to have different and racialized approaches to the police presence. So in Dubai, say, where 90% of the population is foreign, the, my interactions with the police when I was living there as a, you know, as a white Canadian are going to be very different from foreign interactions with the police, say, for migrant labor from South Asia. So choosing categories is always, always a challenge, to choose your categories. How do you divide your subject into categories? And you have to make choices. Uh, and you generalize. It's part of a research. I mean, you can't avoid generalization. So yes, I mean, some Jews could be considered Arabs, but I, you know, it's, it's not. Okay, it, 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 being a Jewish Arab is not like being an Arab Arab in, that, in, in terms of you know, your rights and, and, and your perception as a threat to the state. It's, it's very different. Um, the division within them. So Druze, uh, which we didn't, we didn't do that, but, but if we would, Druze would be much closer to Jews in terms of perception. They serve in the military. Although among them now, there's also some diverse with the new nationality law, but still Druze tend to be more morally aligned with the state. Uh, Christian Arabs uh, are a complex case, but again, too, too much for us to, for us to narrow. Uh, why citizens? Uh, again, categories. Uh, because our thought was that we want to tackle the issue of citizenship. And at least formally, citizens are equal. So then when you ask, does police treat different, differently citizens, then you have a case to argue. Okay, so citizenship is something that is not universal, it's not it's just the formal, it's also the informal and the practical, which, which matters. Um, so when we look at these four groups, we're saying, okay, by law, they should be equal. Okay, de jure, these are citizens. De facto, they are not the same. Why? So if you bring in non-citizens, it would be a different story. I mean, you could talk about, you know, the way the police treats uh, illegal migrants or asylum seekers. Very brutal. Uh, but it would be a different story. And I, th I think the, the formality is important. I think the fact that we look at people who are de, de jure citizens matters. Uh, you'd say, well, yo, these are non-citizens, so it's expected that they'll be treated differently. Okay, the, the, the difference between citizen and non-citizen is trivial. It's within citizenship where we think things, things matter. I have a question as well. Um, so. Again, it's a question about something you didn't do, so, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, but you might have some speculative thoughts or intuitions about it. And so, and it's within the paradigm that you've just explained, right? The, the having selected for the formal category of citizenship first as something meaningful here. And so I'm wondering about settlers who are citizens and who have made themselves into minorities. Um, one might think of it this way, yeah. right? Um, you know, so West Bank settlers, right, who have made themselves into minorities, um, sort of formally not on the territory of Israel, but it's, you know, and things are getting very, yes. very, even ever more complicated. The result of this, yes. Yeah, and, and yet, but there is a police presence, right? Yes. And so, and, and it's often um, a really difficult one between settlers and the, mm -hmm. and the Israeli police. So I'm just wondering if, if there's, there would be anything to be, interesting that could be said there about the relationship yeah. of citizenship and policing. So the Trump plan will resolve all this, so it's <laughs> going to be a temporary issue. Um, 
I was I gave a talk in Montreal a few days ago for the Jewish community there. And there was a there was a newspaper item afterwards. Israeli professor, quote unquote, not impressed with the Trump plan. So <laughs> just for the record, uh, was not impressed. Um, so stutters are a good story, actually, which we did not do. On the one hand, they're privileged Israelis. Okay, they usually belong to, many of them belong to the upper Ashkenazi class. Uh, but then there are clashes between them and police. And actually, I have a student of mine who wrote his PhD on, he looked at the opposite. When do people use violence against the police? And one of his, one of his, one of his case studies is the settlers. And there is among the settlers a, it's not a large group, but the more extreme ones, are totally for using against police violence. You know, if they disturb us from fulfilling our divine mission, then violence is okay. So I think it, it, it's, it's a good case. Um, it will be mostly about not over-policing, not under-policing. It will be about political attempts to create facts on the ground and the police being the ones who would try and prevent that. So it will be a very specific case. But no, we didn't do settlers, but uh, I think your hunch is right. It would, it would be an interesting group. Thank you. Um, just a, a, a very quick question um, about the privatization of the police, um, as this is becoming more and more of a phenomenon that we're seeing across the board, but especially in Israel. Um, I just wonder if the, the, the idea of privatized police and that separation of police or entities that use force becomes more detached from the state, if that affects people's perception or trust in, in any way. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. So it's rather limited, the privatization of police in Israel. It's mostly uh, private security for private homes or for private businesses. Uh, we know from elsewhere that privatized police tends to be worse than regular police often because they're not, they're not accountable. So if I'm a police officer, I tell you to walk away and you think that I'm mistreating you, you have a cause to, you know, I'm a citizen. But if I'm a private guard and I work for this company, then you know, I don't need to explain anything. So there are research that shows that privatized police is worse. Uh, one thing that I can say is that under policing will be accentuated by privatized police. Because it means that stronger groups will be able to compensate for the lack of policing by hiring private police. So I live in a relatively well-to-do neighborhood and we have a private company that monitors our house and comes if something goes wrong. So privatized policing will create a higher difference between those who are poor and rich, and since this correlates also with ethnicity and nationality, it will actually accentuate. So for Arab citizens who are poorer than Jewish citizens, it's not an option, private policing. So in the Jewish neighborhoods, they'll find private policing who might be over-policing them when they enter these neighborhoods. In their own neighborhoods, they'll find nothing. And privatization has this uh, impact where when the stronger, more richer groups buy for themselves services privately, it allows the state to put less resources into those institutions. So if now the education system, now parents begin to buy their own education, then the state has no incentive to invent education because the stronger populations, the ones who are politically active and have a voice, don't care anymore. And the weaker populations, nobody cares about them. So privatization, uh, and you can see that I'm not exactly a right-wing neoconservative, uh, will have a negative effect rather than a positive effect, at least the way I, I see it. I, I have a question as well. I'm, I'm curious as to whether you can say more about um, the particular issue of sort of localized or informal intra-group policing. Because as I understood it, um, and I should say that the national context you're talking about is one that I'm just learning about through you. I have no particular expertise, although the broader thematics resonate a lot with um, research and teaching I do. But I understood you to say that until relatively recently within the Arab-Palestinian population, there was this um, 
sort of uh, neglect, uh, under policing. However, there was also sort of internal maintenance of mm -hmm. uh, order, which for some reason at a certain point devolved. And so therefore there was more of an appetite for um, sort of uh, participation and involvement by state police. I'm curious as to whether you can um, fill us in a little bit on uh, why perhaps that, that happened. But I'm also wondering um, whether any of the uh, people uh, with whom you spoke indicated any sort of appetite for um, sort of more localized, informal uh, sort of policing yep. within their communities and whether yep. that was sort of regarded as a potential solution to these issues or one that would exacerbate um, the uh, inequalities you're, you're talking about. Okay, so um, we can explain this by modernization, which always has a kind of impasse between modernization and what comes afterwards. Uh, I'll give you an example. I live in the south of Israel. We have a large Bedouin, or used to be nomadic communities. And this is observation, not research. Uh, but I've noticed in recent years, something I haven't seen before, young Bedouins coming into the gas station to buy alcohol. Uh, as you know, Muslim tradition does not allow drinking alcohol. And not, not talking about quality wine, but about cheap vodka with plastic glasses. This is a difference, this is a change. So these young people disobey tradition. Um, in a more structural changes, you can think of the high levels of poverty, uh, the lack of infrastructure, uh, limited opportunities, uh, which creates tensions between and creates uh, incentives for certain people to use force to get what they want. Uh, the ability to gain illegal weapons, which is, you don't see that much in Israel, only in the Arab towns and villages. Uh, so all this creates kind of chaos. And it came to a point where now the uh, elders or the more educated leaders simply have very limited power over many of these people. So if they tell them you know, to stop, Nobody cares. They do not listen. These are organized. It, it, it's, it's, it went beyond individuals. Now it's organized crime. These are families that are crime organizations. And that also relates to your second question. Um, it cannot be maintained by local uh, um, non-formal forces. It cannot. It got to a level where these are armed militias almost. And when we talked to Arab citizens, uh, there were two things that, that came up. In, after 2000, the police had the idea of doing uh, community policing in Arab neighborhoods. Now, the idea was that uh, we're going to change relations with police by having friendly officers on the street. So the encounter between an Arab citizen and police officer will be with someone that helps him cross the road or comes to school and gives a lecture. From the Arab perspective, this was part of the neglect of the state. Okay, instead of giving us officers that can do something, you give us those overweight old officers that don't want to work hard anymore, and they can do all this semi-policing. So that was their perspective. Second question was about, who would you like to police your neighborhoods? Would you like to police neighborhoods by Arab police officers? And the answer was actually no. We are supporting, to some extent, the recruitment of Arab officers to the police. But in my neighborhood, I want to have officers who are not necessarily Arab. I want to have professional officers. It makes sense because Arab society is often divided by clans, families, and hamulas. So in the town where I live, which is Rad, is a Bedouin town, they're saying, you know, if this guy's from the other clan, they're not going to listen to him, and vice versa. So from their perspective, bring me someone from the outside who is professional and committed, I'll do with that. The Arab officers, send to the Jewish neighborhoods. We need officers who, are, who, are, uh, who can be objective or at least can be non-affiliated. Non uh, but the level of desperation is so high at the moment that you can really feel it. I'm talking to people that you know, it's just it's simply unbearable. People that you know, lock themselves up in their houses after darkness because they're afraid to go out. All these stories about you know, young people walking in the streets and you know, being shot by accident because some gang exchanges fires. Talking about the thousands of weapons that are every altercation can end up with shooting. This could be a 
a feud with two children, then the parents would come, then the other family would come, and then you have shooting. That is the level of, of desperation in, in, those, in, those, in, in those cities and villages. And again, the, the, their claim is that uh, the state should take responsibility for that. I mean, we're citizens, damn it, you know, do something. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, um, we have a small token of our appreciation oh. sitting behind you that I will get for you. Um, uh, and if everyone could join me in thanking Professor Thank Ben Perrot for such an invigorating talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.